Good morning. Welcome to Brown Cross. We're the Tiersons. Whether you're online or in person, we're glad that you could join us this morning. And if you're newer to the Brown Cross community and you'd like a little bit more information, please feel free to text the word welcome to the number on your screen and somebody will get back to you shortly. And now, get ready to worship with us. Would you stand with us? If you're watching online, thanks for joining us. We're stoked to get to worship with you today. I know God has ways He wants to speak to you and minister to your heart as we worship today. We've been thinking about the promises of God in our series, and that's what this song talks about. So when we get to that bridge, I hope that you sing with confidence and declare that God is good and that His promises never fail. Well, let's sing together. I give you glory for all you brought me through.
your heart. fulfilled in your life that's just because of the goodness of God right come on we're going to sing about that next let's keep going Oh, your mercy never fails me. 
God is good, amen? amen. So this next song that we're going to sing is called Take Heart, and uh, it comes from a line in uh, John 16, 33, where Jesus says, Take heart, for I have overcome. I have conquered the world. And uh, this song, to me, has two very distinct sections. This first piece, the verse and the chorus, is very much about the struggle we go through, the pain that we go through, and that there's a light. It's, it's kind of that hopefulness, and life's not easy. We all know that. But the second part is laying all of that difficulty at the cross before Jesus, knowing that he's overcome. And so take heart, knowing that Christ will take your failures, he'll take your joys, everything, lay it before him. And um, I know for me, kind of reflecting on this song, it's just kind of a season of, of apathy and God calling me back to passion. And so I just challenge all of us as we hear the beginning of this song, reflect on those things that are, God's calling you just to lay before him. And uh, as, we, as we go through this song, give it to him. You can do it through song in ways you can't do it through voice and speaking. Sing it out to him. Lord Jesus, we connect with you in this song.
commit that to him. so much for your goodness, your faithfulness, that you're the same today as you've ever been, that we can lay everything before you. Thank you for the gift of music to be able to cry this out to you in just a, a new expression. And God, we pray for the word to hit us today, that you would speak through Pastor Rob. Connect with us, God. We just praise you and thank you in Jesus' name.
Today is Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, and what does that mean? It means sacred and holy. God made us in His image. We are His image bearers. He gave us each unique talents and gifts, and um, we as a family in Browncroft support life, and we partner with organizations and ministries such as Compass Care. Yeah, our family uh, worked with Compass Care to uh, support a young woman. She was 16 years old and pregnant, and uh, she needed a place to stay, uh, a home where she could feel safe. Uh, many of the people from Browncroft helped support her. They provided furniture and supplies that she needed. Uh, and our family was lucky enough to be blessed and be a part of her family now. She now has a, a four-year-old daughter who's uh, very, very close and dear to our hearts. Mm -hmm. Yes, and as we transition to the offering, um, we just want to thank you so much for your faithful giving. Um, you and your um, ties go to support ministries in Browncroft, such as Mother Care and our partner organization ministries as well. Thank you. Please pray with us. Father God, we come to you this morning. We ask that you would give us a heart that reflects your heart. Mm -hmm. Let us care for life as you would have us care for it. Please take these ties and these offerings and use them to support all of the missions that are in your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Genesis called the way forward, which is a way of talking about the life of faith. We're in our third week in this series, and it talks about or covers the, the chapters in the book of Genesis that talk about the life of Abraham. So we're talking about the life of faith, the life of Abraham. In last week, in the second message, if you weren't here, we talked about one of the great truths in this series, that faith, or one of the great problems of faith is waiting on God. One of the great problems, challenges of faith, the life of faith, is waiting on God. And one of the great temptations in waiting on God is to take matters into your own hands. We'll talk about that a little bit more this morning. But here's one of the big ideas of this entire series, and that is faith, the life of faith that we are called to be uh, in as followers of Jesus. It's not easy. The life of faith. It's 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 calls for for a certain perseverance, a certain persistence, not for common sense. Right? The life of faith is not going to line up with common sense. It calls for believing in gifts from God in your life, in my life, that are not found in the world as we know them. Right? It's calls for a persistence, a belief in God's gifts that I cannot see, I cannot discern, I cannot manufacture from the world um, that I live in, that you live in. This morning we're going to look in Genesis 16 in our continuing study, the copy of the Bible, or you can in your lap or in your phone, we're Genesis 16. 
We're going to look just starting with the first six verses, although we'll read much of the chapter here. Genesis 16, 1 through 6, and a message titled, The Difficulty of Faith. The Difficulty of Faith. Follow along as I read these words, beginning in verse 1. Now, Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar, so she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. So go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abraham agreed to what Sarah said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave and Hagar gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. One of the first important things we learn about the life of faith, um, the challenge of faith, the difficulty of faith in this chapter is you are not who you think you are. Okay? You are not who you think you are. What do I mean? First of all, let's talk about Sarah, who is kind of takes center stage in this story. If, you, if you've been following these three weeks or just are familiar with the book of Genesis, Sarah, in some ways, you might say, is a passive agent so far, right? Her husband gets these, this vision from God. They have a couple conversations, Genesis 12, Genesis 14, excuse me, 15. We looked at it last Sunday. God and Abraham having a discussion. Sarah, of course, is central to the promises that God makes to this couple, right? But this is the first time in the, in the narrative that Sarah actually opens her mouth. It's the first time she kind of takes center stage. And the picture of Sarah that's painted here is not very flattering, right? I mean, Sarah and Abraham both pretty much disbelieve in the promise. Sarah decides, right, that she may think we need, to, we need to take some desperate measures here, right? She, uh, she says, Abraham, listen, the Lord is against me. Not only is it's one thing to think that, you know, God is for me, but he's taking his time. Some of you and I think that. God, when are you going to, I believe that you're for me. I'm getting up again. I'm here another Sunday. I'm, I'm in the game. But God is taking his time. And Sarah's decided now after a number of years in the promised land that God not only is taking his time, God is against her, verse 2. We've got to take some, a different course of action. And she comes up with a very specific course of action. And Abraham um, goes along with her. But it's important for us to appreciate you are not who you think you are. That this decision by Sarah, in my thinking, is not motivated simply by the delay of the promise. It's motivated by the increased anguish that the promise produces. Okay, think about that. It's not simply the delay of the promise, right? Abraham had that delay too. You have that delay. I have that delay. If you're, if you're walking with God, if you're in this journey of faith, there are things. God doesn't give us a schedule of delivery on the promises of God, whatever they might be, whether it's peace or spiritual power or circumstances in your life, right? You have the delay. But in Sarah's case, right, she had a very specific promise. And the, 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 the promise simply increased the anguish uh, as the promise was uh, delayed. The, the promise produced greater anguish. I mean, if you want a child, let's use this example here, and don't have one, if you want to be married and you're not married, if you want a job and don't have it, listen, whatever it is that you might want, if, you're, if you'd like to have better health and you don't have it, any one of those things are hard when you want those good things and you can't have them, right? But when someone promises you those things, right? Someone promises you a job. Someone promises you, in a manner of speaking, a, a marriage proposal. Some, somehow you get a promise to have a child. Sometimes you get some kind of, maybe a, a, a promise from a doctor for your health. Or your, when someone promises you something, well then when that doesn't happen, it becomes a lot harder. How about if that promise comes from God, right? You would assume that the promises that come from God 
would be delivered. In fact, Abraham and Sarah, by the time they're here, although there's no child yet, lots has happened. They, they, they left behind uh, what they were called to leave. They, they left their life as they knew it. We talked about this two weeks ago. Faith is not easy. If you think faith is easy, you, you've been, you've been, someone's told you something that's not true. Someone's told you a lie. You know, as, as G.K. Chesterton said, you know, the Christianity has not so much, much been tried and found lacking as it's been found difficult and left untried. The, the, life, the life of faith is hard. They did that. They left their life behind. They came into the promised land. And many great things happened. Abraham became, even here before he had child, a very wealthy man, Genesis 13 and 14. We didn't look at it. But they did not have a child. Okay? Did not have a child. I think many Christians, think about yourself. I think many of us, if we're honest, we don't even try to live the life of faith. Okay? I'm not talking about coming to church. I'm not talking about, you know, checking the box on the census. I'm talking about actually living by faith. I mean that as you're going to take your cue, not from what the world says, not listen, not even from what you say about yourself, but what God says, you are not who you think you are. That's easier said than done. And I think there's a lot of Christians who don't even try to live by faith. They don't even bother looking for the promises of God for their life because they do not want to be disappointed. I say you have to be willing to be disappointed if you're going to live in the life of faith. Sarah lived 10 years, Abraham 10 years with this promise. 65 is now 75. Let me say something about this culture. Perhaps true in our culture, but certainly in this culture. You need to do some background when you read the Bible. Right? It's written in history to help us understand the message. In this culture, to be a woman who could not have children, you would have been labeled a failure. A fit. Not, not, it's, not, it's not, you know, second best. You're a failure. Look how, open, how it opens. Carefully listen. Now, Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. Okay? Now, today, in, 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 this is a pre-scientific age. Today, if Mr. and Mrs. Smith can't have a child, it's not automatically her fault, right? Maybe it's his fault. But this culture, automatically it's her fault. All right? Sarah had borne him no children. You wouldn't have bothered offering your um, slave, your servant, if they thought it could be his problem. Of course it's her problem. Okay? In this culture, to not have children, you were, you were a failure. And listen, it's part of the whole narrative. You guys know this, right? Or, yeah, I think you do. It's not just Sarah. Her, her, her daughter-in-law, Rebecca, can't have children either. It's a huge part of the story. And her granddaughter-in-law, Rachel, she can't have children either. In fact, Rachel, the big, she's the mother of the 12 tribes of Israel. Rachel is in such disarray. She, Jacob has two wives, Leah, her sister. And Rachel has to sit there while Leah has one, two, three, four children. Okay, that doesn't happen overnight. And every one of those things is like a knife to her heart. And in Genesis chapter 30, she turns to her husband. She goes, give me children, I'm going to die. Okay. In time, all of those women, these women just mentioned, they all have children. They all have important children. But it's very clear in the Bible's narrative that the result of those children were from the promise and the power of God. In Genesis, certainly, but in the Bible, generally, children are a gift from God. Okay, it's one of the things that Aaron was telling, telling me. But it's telling us something else about culture. Right? In this culture, a woman who cannot have children would be considered a failure. But see, our lives are not supposed to be defined by the customs and the limitations of our culture. It's why, by the way, God, think about it if you're God, and I'm the, the, the author of this whole thing. Why would you choose Abraham and Sarah if your goal is to build a nation, that's what the nation of Israel was, was to build a nation out of you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, out of your offspring, I'm going to build a nation that's going to carry my purposes forward in the world. If your job is to build a nation, well, I wouldn't start with a couple that were near the end of their life that were clearly out of childbirth. I'd start with the youngest couple I could find, Joseph and Mary, maybe. But not Abraham and Sarah. Well, God's making a point. 
Because what God is doing, what it means to live by faith, is you're not to be defined by your cultural limitations, defined by the cultural customs. That's why he chose Abraham and Sarah. Listen, that's why he chose David, the eighth son, the shepherd boy, to be the king of Israel. It's why he chose Peter, the salty fisherman, to be the twelfth apostle, to be the chief of the apostles. It's why he chose this man to be the pastor of this church. It's why he chose you, if you're honest. Okay. Think about Peter's life. That you are not who you think you are. Okay, this, this message is there. It's hidden in plain sight. All throughout the Bible. Jesus comes to Simon. And if, if, if Peter was writing his own biography, okay, uh, I would imagine the opening chapter would be Matthew chapter 16, because it's, it's one of the most amazing days in his life. In one year's time or whatever, Peter goes from an anonymous fisherman in, in Galilee, okay, on the the backwater of Israel, an anonymous fisherman, to being a follower of Jesus, sort of, he becomes a follower along with his buddies. But in Matthew chapter 16, by the time you get there, Jesus has become a, a very significant figure in this community, small, small town. Jesus had performed miracles. Jesus had taught things that blew people away. Jesus was, a, was, 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 was the biggest show in town in a manner of speaking. And Peter was one of his followers. So were his friends. But Jesus looks at Peter in Matthew 16. He says, Simon, which was his name, son of Jonah, I'm singling you out for leadership. You will be called Peter. I'm changing your name. That's what happens here in Genesis 17 to Abram and Sarah. I'm changing your name. You will be called Peter. Now, what's the point? Peter means, some of you know this, rock. But what's the point? It says it in the next verse. I'm calling you Peter, and out of you, I'm going to build something very significant. I'm out of you, I'm going to build my church. I haven't even told you guys all about it, but I didn't come here just to preach some sermons. I came here to build an organization that's going to change the world, and I'm going to build it through you. Okay? Upon your Peter, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Here's the keys. Okay. It's the opening chapter of Peter's biography. But, of course, we know that within a year or so, Peter's faith and his life completely implode. Okay. Why? What's the point? Did, did Jesus have poor discernment? Was Jesus not a good read of character? Okay. No. Any more than God the Father was not a good read of character when he picked Abraham. Because you are not who you think you are. You are who God says you are. And the education of faith, faith is not easy, is learning how to live out of that new identity. It takes time. You are not who you think you are. Think about the gospel for a moment. If you're a Christian here this morning. If you've received the gospel, what is the gospel, Rob? The gospel is the good news that God parachuted into this world in the life and death and the resurrection of his son Jesus to bring a message that revolutionizes your life. It's the forgiveness of sin. It's power to become the person that God made you to be, okay, and to be like Jesus. The gospel, through the, the gospel of Jesus Christ isn't just something you, that you do you know, on a day and you become a Christian. The gospel is not only the way in the Christian life, the gospel is the Christian life. Every day you come to it, if you're smart, if you're wise, if you understand what it means to grow, and you begin to nurture yourself on the gospel. Let me say something about the gospel over time. This is the nature of the Bible, the nature of Christian life. It's designed to smash all of the idols in your heart over time. The gospel of Jesus Christ which you don't really know what you're getting into. I mean, it's like, I don't know, any other big thing in life. You know, you don't really know exactly what you're getting into when you become a Christian. But God gives you the gospel. The Holy Spirit comes into your life. And God has a purpose. He's got an agenda. And the gospel of Jesus Christ to remake you is going to smash every idol in your life over time. Tim Keller, in one of his books, said this. What's an idol? What's that mean? Let me, let me put it there. What he says is very helpful. An idol is anything that is more important to you than God, Christian. 
anything that that's not just bad things. Well, I, I don't do drugs anymore. I don't, well, you know, anything that's more important to you than God. Right? Anything. Good things. You know what was for Sarah? Failure. Right? Sarah had not born Abraham any children. A woman in this culture that could not have children was a failure. That became more important to her than God. Right? Some of us in this room, some people listening to me, you're Christians, you come to church like me. But if you're honest, you wouldn't know how to live by faith. You, you, you haven't trusted God. You haven't gotten out of your comfort zone. You haven't put yourself out there. You're so afraid of being disappointed. You're so afraid of a failure. You're so afraid of that hurt. You live in a safe bubble and you've never taken a step forward because the life of faith is hard. Right? The idols of our heart. Failure is one. Listen, children can be one. Anything that's more important to you than God. Marriage can be that. Listen, wait for it. Politics can be that. Right? Anything that's become more important to you than God. You are not who you think you are. Step number one in the life of faith. You are who God says you are. Do you know who, in the deepest part of your heart, do you know who you are? Do you know that you're loved by God? Think about it. Loved. Passionately loved by God, lavishly loved. But do you believe? Do you know that? If you don't know that, then you don't know who you are. Do you know that you are gifted? First Corinthians twelve. Not it's not just oh this group of people and that group of people. No, every single person listening to me right now, if you're a Christian, you have been gifted by God. Do you know what they are? Do you know that you've been called according to God's purpose for you? You are not who you think you are. You're who God says you are. Second thing, the heart of this message. <laughs> God hears your misery. What an interesting way to talk about it. Not hears your prayer. <laughs> Sometimes you go, see, people who, are, who, who don't really have a, a, an attitude that have been so defeated, so, 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 so resolved that God's never going to do anything, like, they're not big prayers. Right? But God even hears your misery. Verse 7. Middle of the chapter. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, listen, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. Sounds like the Abrahamic promise. The end, the angel of the Lord said to her, you are now pregnant, pregnant, and, uh, and, and um, will give you, you are now pregnant, and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael. Sounds like the Christmas story. For the Lord God has heard your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. He will live in hostility towards his brothers. She then, right? she says, I'm going to get the name giving business to. She then gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For he said, I have now seen the one who sees me. The first couple, I call Abraham and Sarah the first couple, to have faith, they could not be seen in a more worse light than they are here. I don't think so. Okay? Completely reject the promise that they were just given in chapter 15. Right? You wouldn't bother sleeping with Hagar if you believed that you were going to have a child out of your own flesh and blood. Completely disregard the promise. Their anxiety does in their lives, it's an illustration what it often does in us. Anxiety often results in careless plans that backfire and cause a lot of pain. Not only pain for them, right? Sarah's in distress. This is a nightmare. Okay, what happened? They throw this woman out like the trash, right? You know, it's not only a for them, but listen, for a lot of people, 
He will live in hostility toward all his brothers. Talking about Ishmael. Quick history lesson for you. 10 or 11 chapters forward, but over 100, 130 or 40 years. Ishmael, the son of Abraham, has 12 sons, 12 rulers. They became a nation. And they became hostile towards everybody, including Israel, even before you get out of the book of Genesis. They're called the Arab people, particularly Muslim Arabs, to, to tie their roots back to Ishmael. The Middle East crisis, as we know it, started right here in Genesis chapter 16. But that's not the most amazing thing. Because that doesn't throw God. God blessed her. The most amazing thing about this chapter is not the mess that we make of our lives. That God in his mercy not only rescues this woman who's been thrown out to the trash, kind of speaking, right? Get rid of her. But he uses her to send a message back to the faithless couple of Abraham and Sarah. He says, listen, Hagar, I'm going to do some good things with you. I love you, but this is what I want you to do. Do me a favor, Hagar, the angel of the Lord, the presence of God. Go back to Abraham and Sarah and tell them this. I hear your misery and I see you. The message was for them. Look at verse 15. Last two verses of the chapter. So, hey, she goes back. Hagar bore Abraham a son. What does God do with our messes? Sometimes he turns it into something lemonade. Right? So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave Abram, because this is, this is the nature of the cultural practice, the father. Abram choked out, <laughs> gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abraham was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. You know what the name Ishmael means? God. Do me a favor, Hagar. I want you to go back to Abraham and Sarah. To this couple that thought that I don't hear them anymore, that I don't care about them anymore, that I've, I'm not really paying attention to them anymore. I've given up on them. Although they've given up on me, I want you to send them a message and say, listen, I, I can't hear your prayer because you didn't give me one. <laughs> I hear your misery. And I see you. It's not just a message for Abraham and Sarah. And let me say this too, guys. It's, it's, it's for every one of us. This is why, by the way, community is so important in your life. See, there's a lot of Christians, I won't pick on anyone here, uh, you know, or you know, around church, who, 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 who come to church, maybe know their Bible, but they're not really in accountable community. They're too busy. They're, they're too above it. But let me tell you why community is so important. Why prayer is so important, praying for other people. I'll tell you why community and prayer are so important. Because many of us, either as a course of our lives or in times of our lives, we become so faithless, so unbelieving. The idols of our heart are bigger than God. We don't believe God would ever do anything in my life spectacular. God would ever deliver on a promise. I walk through the motions. I come to church. I'm a Christian, but I don't really believe for myself. So when it comes time to the small group says, Rob, what do you want to pray for? I go, I'm fine. I'm all as well. Oh, I don't have any. No. How about you, Ken? So Ken, because he has a little more courage, Ken says, listen, I, I got a real problem in my life. And I'm asking you guys to pray for me. So I'm going to pray for you. And over time, I see God answers his prayer. And God resolves his misery. And God blesses him. And God does all that simply to say something to me. The Lord has heard your misery. God knows your pain. He's witness to your life even when you're waiting on God's promises. So, to the childless in this room, whatever that means, to the married -less in this room, to the sick in this room, listen, to the hopeless in this room, I got a message for you. God here. And God sees you. Right? That's what Genesis 16 is about. Last point. Don't miss this. Because this is important for understanding this truth. Your life is simply the setting for God's word. Now what do I mean by that? 
your life, my life, these guys are examples to us. These things were written, that Romans 15, as an as example so that you know how to live uh, faithfully with God, to paraphrase. In other words, they're here for a reason that we spent all these chapters on the life of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Peter, Paul, Mary, etc. They're here for a reason. Genesis 16, I don't know how you could say otherwise, is a narrative nose dive. Okay? Nothing in this chapter is good. Everyone in this chapter is, 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 a, um, is, is an antitype. You know, that Abraham and Isaac and, and Sarah are the, the, the father of all those who believe. Are you kidding me? And not only did they show the worst kind of um, character, Abraham, this is your fault. And you caused this mess. This woman's driving me nuts. Well, what do you bother me for? Throw her out. What should I do to her? I could care less what you do to her. Right. Give me the remote. No. I mean, that's, 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 that's Abraham. Even Hagar, although we have a heart for her, she's not an exemplary character either. In this culture, not in ours, she was her, Sarah was her um, lord. She, she, rubbing her pregnancy in, her, in Sarah's face was not a very exemplary thing to do. Nobody in this chapter is, 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 has good character. The person who turns this, character, this chapter around is the, is the angel of the Lord, okay? Four times, starting in verse seven. The angel of the Lord who is in the presence of God. What's the point? In this account, almost done. In this account, I would even say in the whole Bible, but let's just say Genesis 16. The story is not the point. The story is not the message. This is why some people have a hard time reading the Bible. Friends of mine, friends of yours. Oh, the Bible's a mess. There's genocide. There's rape. There's the, you know, the Bible. Are you crazy? The story's not the message. The Bible is not a book of virtues. Right? Who told you that? Listen, the only outside of Jesus Christ himself, of course, he's the exception. Jesus Christ is the exception. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus Christ led an exemplary life. He demonstrates what it means to be God or to walk with God. And he is our, our model as well as our savior. And he demonstrates he's cool under fire. He does not retaliate. He loves the unlovely. He's a demonstration of morality, you know, personified. Right? But outside of Jesus Christ, pretty much everyone else is a train wreck. Okay. It's, think about the life of Abraham and Sarah in Genesis 16. Peter, you know, Jesus, never heard of him. Never heard of him. Got nothing to do with that guy, you know. Uh, David, you know, uh, uh, not and on. Okay. The Bible is not a book about morality. Stop reading it that way. What is it about, Rob? It's a book about the intervention of God. It's a book about the rescue of God. It's a book about the power of the words of God to reshape your life and wait for it and give you a new identity. And if you start reading it that way, it'll start helping you smash the idols of your heart. It'll do a couple things. It will help lift your spirits. It will heal your heart. And it will help if you learn how to work with it to help you day by day live out of the identity that God has actually given you in Jesus Christ. The life of faith is difficult. You are not who you are. There is a, the, reason you're, the reason you haven't made any progress in your life, the reason you've just been going to church forever and haven't really grown, and you're just, you're just a Christian, uh, you know, uh, dressed up like someone who isn't a Christian, and, a man, and the way that you live your life, and you haven't really lived by faith. You, haven't, you, you don't even have a promise book. You don't even believe in these kind of things. Why is that for some of us? Because we don't really understand. Step number one is you're not who you think you are. This is basic Christianity. Right? You're, 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 you're getting your report card from the world. From you know, the, the news. 
you know, politics, po the world's going to hell. Oh my goodness, so and so is the president. Are you kidding me? Or, or what, what, where do we get this from? You are not who you say you are. We're not defined by the limitations of our culture. We're not defined by the promises of our culture. That's why God chooses a childless couple. That's why God chooses a, a know-nothing teenager to be king. That's why God chose Peter. That's why he chose me. That's why he chose you. So you learn how to live a different way. You are not who you think you are. You're who God says you are. It takes time. And in the middle of that time that we're all living in, I want you to know this, right? Sometimes God's so loving, right? so caring. We make such messes of our lives, but he, he sends us people when we're not even praying, when we're not even caring anymore. When we've stopped believing, and he says, listen, I want to send you, right? I'm going to send you Ken Kennedy. I'm going to send him to you, Bob to tell you through his life that I hear you. I hear your misery, even when I don't hear your prayers. And I see you, I love you, and I have a purpose for your life. Amen? Let's pray. God, we thank you for this time this morning. We love you. We come to you, Lord, with open hearts and um, open ears. And Lord, I, I, I come to you. I, I, I uh, Lord, confess my faithlessness at times, my discouragement at times, my, Lord, um, you know, go through the motions Christianity at times, where, Lord, I um, don't practice what I preach, where I don't live uh, by faith in the way that you've called me to, where I take my... Um, I get my report card from the world instead of from you. I listen to the world instead of listening to you. And I get discouraged. And I begin to think that nothing interesting is going to happen in my life. That the promises of God are not for me. But Lord, help us today in this room to readjust our thinking. To be open, Lord. To understand what it even means to be a Christian. I pray the gospel of Jesus Christ would have a greater um, work in my heart, in our hearts. I pray it would detonate and smash the idols of my heart, Lord, whatever they might be, uh, Lord, that I might begin to believe that I am not who I think I am, but who you say I am. Help me, Lord even when I can't pray, to know that you hear my misery. You do see me. You do see us. And help us, Lord, to submit our lives to your word, to believe that your words, thus saith the Lord, the angel of the Lord said, and it was so, would help us, each of us, to begin to live more out of the new identity that you have given us in Jesus Christ. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Rob, for that great message. We look forward to next week.